could get into a, a carriage and be driven over to the river where she would get in her boat and go across the river to uh, uh, oops, okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, to Black Rose Island. Black Rose Island was the, the institution in New York City at a um, different hospitals and a penitentiary there. And why would she be going every week to Black Rose Island? Well, she was going as a member of the State Charity Aid Association of New York City, and her grandmother would go every week and would take inspection. She would inspect the conditions. She would inspect the, how everybody was being treated. And then she would bring that report back to the State Charity Aid Association and would try to protect these people by putting pressure on political leaders. And she would come home from these and she would have lunch and she'd sit down with these three girls and tell them all about what she saw. So, you know, that kind of got to inspect that uh, the, uh, expression, you can't be it unless you see it, see it, you can be it, that kind of thing. Well, I think that the, her grandmother, Geraldine Hoyt, another Geraldine, uh, was an extreme, very, very important influence on her. I was able to find something else uh, about her because, as I said, very few sources remain for women in history. When she passed away in April of 1897, there was a, uh, a religious service for her, and I printed a memorial book, a memorial book that had the sermon that was given by the minister that day, and also they included an article praising Mrs. Hoyt. And this is a little excerpt from the uh, memorial book, which I am grateful to the Statsburg Historic State Historical Site uh, through the New York Park System provided me with this. Quote, few people who know anything about the family from which Mrs. Hoyt came have failed to notice how passively her administration seems to run it. They like to run things. We're not sure, right? It is certain that the trait is very noticeable, and in none of them more than in Mrs. Hoyt, whose practical sense and shrewdness were constantly displayed in the works of charity to which she devoted herself. Kind and forgiving as she was, she made herself everywhere felt. After her death, someone at Bellevue Hospital asked what special ward she had been interested in. The answer given illustrated the effect of her influence. It was neither one word nor another. The whole hospital was Mrs. Hoyt's. She never hurt people's feelings. She was never rude, never arrogant, and was totally devoid of pride of position. Yet she was never compliant, never failed to express her opinion unmistakably, and remained the superior of her equals without ever asserting any superiority. She was always looked up to though she never seemed herself to look down. So here's somebody who's being, uh, being described very similar to what, how we would describe Mrs. Thompson. Somebody who is kind and is interested in helping others and knows how to run things, right? And that certainly is part of Mrs. Thompson's profile as well. She was also part of the founding of the nursing program at Bellevue Hospital. We probably, you know, kind of take nursing for granted, but nursing was a new profession after the Civil War. Nursing did not exist as a trained profession. And so Mrs. Thompson, um, Mrs. Hoyt, and the other women in the State Charity Aid Society were concerned that people at the hospital have trained nurses to take care of them. And so they went and visited Florence Nightingale in England. And they got their course of study and they brought it back to New York and they said, this is how we're going to run our nursing program. So she was really at the ground floor of creating the nursing program, the first one in the United States. I think she's a pretty good model, you know, when we're looking back. She's very similar to Mrs. Thompson. So I got to think, if we're interested in what shaped Mrs. Thompson, if we want to understand what made Mrs. Thompson who she is, these are the influences. Her grandmother is a very important influence. Another really important influence, I think, is her education. I mentioned before that she was not uh, 
she did not go to school, and she was tutored at home. But after her father passed away, the family moved to France for a couple of years. And this is still a little, I'm still a little unsure of all the timelines. There are ship manifests that show the mother, her brother, her three sisters, all going to, uh, to Europe and coming back. But there's not a whole lot of detail I know at this point. I do know that she went to the Sacred Heart School in France. And so I looked a little bit into the Sacred Heart School. What was the Sacred Heart School? What was their mission? And what I learned was that the Sacred Heart School was founded by a, uh, a French uh, nun named Madeleine Sophie Barat. And she founded this Society of the Sacred Heart as a result of the French Revolution. So the French Revolution was very violent, enormous upheaval in French society, and she was really distressed at the violence and the loss of order in France after the French Revolution in the early 19th century. She decides that she's going to begin the Sacred Heart as a solution to France's disorder. Her idea was to educate women, which was not a popular idea at the time. She believed that if you educate women, you can restore France's moral order. And so she began the schools of the Sacred Heart with nuns as the teachers who were very, um, very strictly trained and, and had to pass exams in order to be able to be in the classroom. And she believed that they had a duty to repair society's flaws and that it was educated women who were going to be the chief means of social change. That the mission of the school was to cultivate virtuous, moral women who are also well-educated, helpful, and intelligent. And this idea of helping and being a servant to your community, I think, comes from this education that she received at the School of the Sacred Heart. She goes for two years, and her sisters do too. And then I found this. So, this is a little bit out of our time frame, but wanted to introduce something else that I thought was a really important influence on Mrs. Thompson. I found an article in the New York Times from December of 1926. And in this article, it describes Mrs. Roosevelt, who was not obviously the first lady yet, she was still just Eleanor Roosevelt. Mrs. Roosevelt was arrested for picketing with paper box makers on Green Street and West Houston Street. And she was picketing alongside seven other society women. The other women are Mrs. Gordon Norrie. That's Margaret. That's her sister, Margaret. She's with Margaret. And she's also with the last person in that highlighted section, Miss Evelyn Preston. Miss Evelyn Preston was Geraldine Thompson's niece. So when I found this, I said, they get arrested. <laughs> they go pick it with the in solidarity with these paper box makers in Greenwich Village, and they get. Uh, the police tell them to go home, and they say no, and they get dragged into the paddy wagon, and they get arrested together. And so the article says that um, the arrests were made while the police were dispersing a small crowd of strikers who were lingering in Green Street and obstructing the sidewalk. So I'm thinking, wow, these, these other women in the family are also really important. So I began looking into her niece and her sister. This is a picture of her sister that I actually only just got. 
this picture of Margaret Murray. So Margaret Morgan Murray, this is Geraldine Thompson's older sister. This woman was just incredible. And I think she had an enormous, enormous influence in Geraldine Thompson's life. And when she died, I think that her death, Mrs. Thompson took harder than any other tragedy in her life. And she had plenty. So Margaret Murray distinguished herself as a suffragist. She was the leader of the New York Women's Suffrage Association. She was a founder of the Colony Club. And the Colony Club is sort of the, equi the female equivalent to like the Knickerbocker Club and these other men's clubs in New York where wealthy women would get together and they would have speakers and they would have lunch and play cards and things like that. She was a progressive reformer. She was extremely dedicated to temperance. And this is another issue that Mrs. Thompson is also a, a real advocate for. Temperance was to outlaw alcohol. And so she was a member of the Temperance Society, but she was also a, um, after the 18th Amendment was passed, she worked really hard to force the, uh, the uh, government to enforce it because you can have prohibition, but if nobody's arresting anybody and everybody's just sort of the wind saying, yeah, you can take that wine, you know. So she was a uh, real, uh, really an advocate for enforcement of the 18th Amendment. And she wrote a really well circulated article called I serve no cocktails. And I found this article that she, this interview she gave, it's really, a, it's really an essay in the form of an article uh, that uh, is easy to find online. You can read it and it's terrific. She really describes drinking in the high society homes and how people drink, you know, three different kinds of wine at dinner, and then they have a drink, and then they have an after dinner drink, and then they have another drink, and then they have it. And so she talks about how uh, destructive it is. And she's really a incredibly um, courageous, passionate woman. And so she was also um, a, a, a very well-known reformer in New York City. And she's only like three years older than Geraldine Thompson, but she is just an incredible person. And then I found this. I was just so blown away by this. Yeah. So Frances Perkins, you guys know Frances Perkins was the first secretary of labor who was a woman, right? The first uh, cabinet secretary as a, who was a woman. And she was appointed by FDR uh, to serve in the Roosevelt administration. And she's responsible for writing the Social Security Act and the Fair Labor Standards Act, the minimum wage, eliminating child labor. She is probably the most significant Secretary of Labor in American history. What turned Frances Perkins into a lobbyist was her experience at the Triangle Factory Fire in 1911. And you know, Elizabeth Warren talks about this. If you ever listen to Elizabeth Warren speak, she still talks about this. Elizabeth Warren kind of talks about this ish, this event. I was reading a um, biography of Frances Perkins, and in the biography of Frances Perkins, I'm reading the chapter on the Triangle Fire, which takes place in March 25th of 1911. In the beginning of the chapter, talks about Frances Perkins being at Washington Square, which I knew she was there, but I didn't know why. She was visiting Margaret Murray that morning, that afternoon, when the Triangle Fire broke out. So I went and I looked at the oral history uh, files with Columbia University. Columbia University has these, uh, these oral histories, and they have an oral history of Frances Perkins. And this is what Frances Perkins says about Mrs. Murray. I was in Washington Square at the time of the fire by pure chance. I was having tea with Mrs. Gordon Murray, who lived on the north side of the square. She was Margaret Morgan by birth. She was the sister of Ruth Morgan. She was a little known, she was a well-known person and a friend of mine. So I'm like, okay. So not only uh, is 
Martin, a incredible, courageous reformer, but she is really also really uh, inspired by the same things that people like Eleanor Roosevelt and Frances Perkins are. And she's with them in all these crusades and all these different efforts. The connection to Frances Perkins just blew me away. And I realized that uh, the connection, the, the, inter the intersection of all these incredible women is just going to enrich Mrs. Thompson's story. Unfortunately, about 10 months later, Margaret Murray died. She died in August of 1927. And I actually, I had to, because I, I couldn't, I couldn't, my, my curiosity was too strong. I, I actually ordered her death certificate from the uh, Vital Records to see I was like, what happened. I have to know what happened to her. And so her death hits Geraldine Thompson like a ton of bricks. She's just absolutely devastated. And everyone is devastated. The articles in the paper that were for um, the, the tributes to her from the other women she worked with in these organizations make her cry. That's how absolutely beautiful they are. And so I took an excerpt, one excerpt from uh, one of them. She was on the board. This is, uh, Margaret was on the board of a, a magazine called The Nation. And so the nation did a special tribute to her and it's published in an, um, a booklet that I got from Smith Library. So these libraries, man, they're, they're saving me. Um, and so this was part of the beautiful uh, tribute that was written and published in the nation. Margaret Nori took the unpopular side, facing the scorn and smears of friends, but facing also the facts, realizing the extent of the opposition. She was the kind to make any renunciation for herself at any price if it meant to benefit the common weal. To be unpopular because of her championing unpopular causes, that meant nothing to her. So she is just an incredibly courageous person and fought for suffrage and, and fought for temperance and fought for the the paper box makers, and she's, she's this person. And then I remembered something that I had read in Triangle of Land. So in Triangle of Land, there's a, from actually a biography, a manuscript of a biography of Mrs. Thompson that was never published, and I don't know where it is, but somebody started a biography of Mrs. Thompson that was never published. And they asked her, the, uh, the historian interviewing her, asked her, what was, you know, all these years, you, you know, you're, you reached this old age, you know, what is your, you know, what is your uh, secret? And she said, keep working for at least one cause, preferably an unpopular one. She said that in 1965. Margaret died in 1927, and I couldn't help but be just blown away by that connection. I feel that she really devoted her work in large part to serve her sister's memory. And after her sister died in 1927, so she died in August of 1927. At that time, Mrs. Thompson was a member of the Republican National Committee. She had a very important position in the Republican Party. October 12th, she sends a letter of resignation to the head of the Republican National Committee. And the, the letter is, is heartbreaking in a lot of ways. Uh, she talks about, you know, she talks about the political issues. And then at the end of the letter, she gets personal and she writes this. What I find now is that the death of Mrs. Murray had laid an obligation upon me to give more time to the understanding of political truths and political philosophy. It has perhaps something of a memorial, as I am undertaking what I know will prove a hard task for me, as a tribute of deep admiration and affection to one who always chose the difficult path of a pioneer. Her sister is an immigrant, right? 
something that I had absolutely no idea about before until I started connecting the dots between the paper box makers and the and the trying of fire and all these things started to make sense to me. Her other sister, Ruth, Ruth Morgan, Ruth never married. She has sometimes uh, been claimed also as a, um, a gay woman. Uh, she is being uh, embraced as a gay woman now. But she is equally as important to Geraldine Thompson's life. She was the founder of the, club, of the Colony Club, and she was vice president of the League of Women Voters. She worked with Terry Tatt and was very important in the suffrage cause. During World War I, she was one of five high commissioners and went to Europe during World War I and ran the entire nursing organization for the Red Cross. When she came back, she became a peace activist because World War I changes people's perception of nationalism and war. And Ruth Morgan and Margaret Norrie, both of them, became very devoted to outlawing war and supporting peace. And Ruth Morgan was the head of the International Alliance of Women's Committee for Peace. And she also um, was an officer for the National Committee on Cause and Cure for War, which you may have heard of. She advised Hoover on peace. She advised Roosevelt on peace. She was a very big deal. No papers. Save your papers. I can't tell you, this woman deserves a book and there's no papers, it's, it's heartbreaking. Now, she does have a lot of letters in the Eleanor Roosevelt collection, which I have now, uh, but just an absolutely incredible individual who also um, was an enormous, enormous influence on Mrs. Johnson. So influences, her grandmother, her education, and her two sisters. The other big influence is her own personal tragedy of tuberculosis. She uh, contracted tuberculosis, I don't know when, she says when she was a young woman. Uh, Betty Blackcock does tell a story about how she would go out and ride her bike and then, you know, hemorrhage, you know. Uh, so, you know, that's, uh, you know, how tuberculosis makes itself evident. Uh, so, she had tuberculosis as a young woman. She very rarely spoke about it. In fact, um, only in one interview, she talks about uh, that as a young lady, the interviewer, the newspaper man, asks her, uh, you know, why did you give so much money to tuberculosis? And she says, well, as a young woman, I had to travel around because I had tuberculosis. So where is she traveling to? She travels to Colorado. Dry air and uh, the altitude was thought to be helpful. There was no cure for tuberculosis because, you know, even today tuberculosis is still a problem. But in the 19th century, it was it was really uh, the biggest killer of people in the 19th century. And actually, a lot of people in this family died of tuberculosis. The Thompsons have terrible tuberculosis in their family and that side of the family. And her one nephew, uh, the Preston, Evelyn Preston's brother, he dies of tuberculosis. So tuberculosis is everywhere. Rich and poor. The only uh, treatment that they recommended for it was the sanitary protocol. Sit outside in the cold, dry air. Eat really heavy diet so you don't waste away. And rest complete rest. And you see people resting outside on these lounge chairs, uh, these nice wicker lounge chairs, to take the sun, to take the air, and to rest. And uh, tuberculosis is really tricky because even if you recover from tuberculosis, it kind of, it never, it never dies. It stays alive. The white blood cells kind of encase it, but it can be reactivated. You know, like when you see the commercials for those steroidal drugs on TV, and they say, don't take this if you have tuberculosis, if you've ever had tuberculosis, because steroids will reactivate tuberculosis. 
In fact, that's what killed Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor Roosevelt had also had tuberculosis. She recovered. But then in 1962, she took a steroidal treatment, reactivated her tuberculosis, and killed her. So tuberculosis was it's a very tricky, uh, very tricky condition. And we know, you know, we, we've been through our own plan recently, so we understand how these pulmonary type things are, are terrible uh, to manage. I think Colorado is another really important part of my story. So I know she was in Colorado. I found her in a newspaper in 1895. There was an article uh, that talks about her attending a dance at the El Paso Club. I had this big dance, a big party, and Miss Morgan of New York was there. I'm like, there you are. I found you. So she was in Colorado for health reasons, but apparently she had a little club while she was there as well. Um, and she meets her husband. So she meets her husband in Colorado as well. So that's another important reason for Colorado playing a big role in her life. And Luna Geraldine Thompson returned to Colorado all the time. They turned up back in Colorado almost every single year. They maintained this connection to Colorado. And I just recently learned that actually Betty was born in Colorado and that she was baptized in Colorado. Uh, Lou shows up in the papers there every year because he goes out west to, for a hunting trip. And so he's in the paper. L.S. Thompson is in town for his annual hunting trip. So it is a very important part of their marriage and also uh, for their health. In addition, I think that Colorado, I wonder, also had a political influence on her. And the reason I'm thinking this is because she was in Colorado when Colorado enfranchised women. Women were enfranchised in Colorado in 1893, 27 years before the rest of the country, and the Republican women's uh, campaign in Colorado was extremely active. They were fantastic campaigners, and the men candidates in Colorado are like, these, these women are fantastic. They're like getting all these votes, and they're, and they're working the campaign. So she, I can imagine her sitting in one of those chairs, sitting outside, and reading the paper, and reading about all this, uh, this stuff. And so I wonder, and this is something I've been exploring, is does the political activism of the women in Colorado inspire her? Does she get kind of excited by the politics of the Republican women's groups? Does she get well as well? And she meets her husband. Lewis S. Thompson. This is a story that is told in different ways through Betty's letters and different ways through interviews with Mrs. Thompson. Mrs. Thompson is asked how she met her husband. She says, we met in a health resort in Colorado. Her husband, Lewis Thompson, was born in 1865. So he's seven years older than she is, but he's in very, very bad health. He had typhoid and tuberculosis. He had one lung left from suffering from tuberculosis. And he was very, very sick. He goes to Colorado to get better also. I have not been able to find records in Colorado because patient records are really hard to get because of HIPAA, even though it's like 130 years ago, you can't because of HIPAA, you can't get people's patient records. Even when I look in the when I'm in the state archives and I'm looking at some of these uh, prison records, the prison uh, reformatories that I'm looking at, I have to sign something to say I won't use a prisoner's name. It's 120 years ago, you know, but still, you have to sign that you're not going to use anybody's name. So be that as it may, I don't know which hospital, sanatorium, or health resort they were in yet. I'm still, I'm a dog with a bone trying to find it. So she meets Lou Thompson there. She says she met him at a health resort. Betty Babcock tells a slightly different story. In Betty's letter, she says that Geraldine was introduced to Lou through his sister. His sister was living in Colorado Springs also, and she met 
Geraldine and apparently wrote a telegram to her brother saying, I've just met the girl you should marry, come at once. Which makes it a better story, and it's a bit more romantic, but I'm not sure if it's actually accurate or not. Betty tells a very good story, I have to say. Um, be that as it may, she does meet Ruth Thompson, and this is at a time when the Thompson family is going through a tremendous amount of turmoil. Uh, but before I get to the turmoil, I'm just going to talk a little bit about their um, engagement. Lou wrote a letter, and I've just recently found this letter. He wrote a letter to his uncle. Lou's uncle was J.N. Camden, Johnson Newman Camden, who was a United States senator from West Virginia. Don't worry, I've never heard of him either. And because he was a United States senator, they say he's a And he was Lou's uncle, and he was Lou's father, his Lou's father's brother-in-law. But they were business together and they were very, very close. So um, he's Camden is married to uh, Lou's aunt, Annie. These papers are in the University of West Virginia, not categorized. So everything from 1892, in a box. Everything from 1893, in a box. If you want to find a letter, you have to go through the whole box. So I know the years I want, <laughs> so I can narrow it down a little bit. But this is the letter that just came to me. So this is a letter from Lewis Thompson to his uncle, May 10th, 1896. My dear uncle, as you keep posted on the important events of the day, I don't suppose you will be surprised to hear the news of my engagement to Miss Morgan of New York. When I read that, I almost made it. Some unofficial rumors have been flying about, but this one is official from headquarters, and I am glad to say meets with generous and hearty approval. June 20th has been set for the day of the wedding, which will, of course, be a very simple and quiet affair. I am counting on you and Aunt Annie to be on hand and to give your blessing and good wishes for our future happiness. With love from us all to you and yours, affectionately, your nephew, Louis S. Thompson. You know, just having that corroboration, that verification of the event, was so important to me. I knew that they had gotten engaged. I didn't know what happened. But now at least, and I have to say, you sound so happy in that note. You know, you sound so happy. It's official from headquarters. I'm getting married. Get over and visit me, right? She goes, get out here and come to the wedding, right? So she he is, he's so too happy. They do get married, but not on June 20th. They get married on June 16th. I don't know what happened. But they get married on June 16th. They get married at St. Margaret's Church in Statsburg, New York, which is a tiny, little, adorable church that was built by Geraldine's great grandfather and great grandmother, named after her great grandmother, Margaret, in, you know, in kind of honor of her. And I went and saw the little church when I went up to the Eleanor Roosevelt papers. It is just the most adorable little, little church. And so then they got married. They had a special train from New York bring all the high society family members and all the high society guests to Statsburg for the wedding. And then they have a beautiful lunch at grandmother's house at the point, which I showed you that picture of the point earlier. They have the wedding lunch at the point. And shortly after that, they moved to Brookdale Farm. So I'm gonna get you to Brookdale. So let me talk a little bit about Brookdale and to the Thompsons and the turmoil in the Thompson family. So how do the Thompsons acquire Brookdale Farm? They acquire Brookdale Farm uh, after the death of David Dunham Withers. David Dunham Withers was a wealthy businessman who had become a big fan of horse racing. 
he made his money in the southern state. He was actually a New Yorker who moved to Mississippi and Louisiana. He had cotton and sugar plantations, you know what that means, and slave labor. And during the Civil War, he, he doesn't want to get involved or two sides um, in the war. So he goes to France and he decides, I'm just rich, I'm just going to hang out in France for the next, uh, until this war is over. And while he's there, he becomes a big fan of horse racing. And while he is uh, becoming a big fan of horse racing, he becomes studying it. And he was a, he was a very uh, kind of a intellectual fan of horse racing. He builds this big horse library and books and studies it. When the war is over and he returns to the United States, he begins to buy land adjacent to each other, buy different parcels of land, and he makes a field farm by combining all these different parcels together. The farm, he picks this land in Monmouth County because it was extremely good for farming and for horses. That there was, the soil was um, enhanced with marl, which is a potash of a kind of green clay, which is very good for growing crops and it's very good for the horses' feet. And it had three streams that was very well ordered. So he buys this plot of land and he begins to design and uh, to oversee the construction of all the rings and the barns and the stables and everything. And some of these buildings are still there. But then how is he going to raise horses there, right? Remember, during the Civil War, most of the good bloodlines died in the Civil War battlefields. So he begins to import horses from Europe, imports horses from Europe, and begins to breed horses, and re really kind of revives American horse racing by restoring the bloodlines of these great American racehorses. And he becomes famous. He becomes known as the Sage of Brookdale for uh, these incredible uh, racehorses he's raising and winning these prizes all over the place. Mama Thurk became uh, up for sale, and he gets a group of men together, his friends, and they buy Mama Thurk, and he wants to make Mama Thurk the ascot of America. He wants to emulate English racing. And so he was, um, he was a very scrupulous person. He never bet. So somebody in horse racing who doesn't bet on horses. So he was very suspect by all the other horse racing men. They were like, what's wrong with him? He doesn't bet. So he never placed a bet, but he loved to win. And he loved the intellectual challenge of building and racing these horses. So he spends 20 years doing this at Brookdale from about 1872 until his death in 1892. When he died, he had never married and he had no, he had no children. So his estate was left to his brothers and sisters and they sold it. It went on the market and Lewis Thompson's father, William Payne Thompson, bought it. It's likely that they knew each other. He probably knew others. Uh, Lydia's knew Geraldine's father, too. Uh, they were both members of the Knickerbocker Club. And when Geraldine's father died, in the funeral article on the funeral of Geraldine Thompson's father, William Dare Morgan, David Dunham Withers is listed as one of his pallbearers. So she had this connection to Brookdale before she even knew she had a connection to Brookdale. William Dean Thompson and his uh, wife, Mary Evelyn Moffitt Thompson, uh, bought Brookdale Farm. And the way that the Thompsons become interested in Brookdale Farm is that uh, Colonel Thompson uh, had, after the Civil War, he was a, uh, he fought the Civil War on the side of the Confederacy. He was a colonel in the 9th Virginia Cavalry. He fought it at the Maddox, he fought a full run. And after the war, he went into 
newspaper business for a while, and then he went to the oil business. And Camden, who I told you I got all these papers from, who was the U.S. senator from West Virginia, was his business partner. So he and Camden start this oil business in West Virginia, and ultimately it becomes uh, bought by John D. Rockefeller at Standard Oil. When his oil company is uh, combined into Standard Oil, he becomes one of the directors of Standard Oil and works down the hole on John D. Rockefeller. And he makes a fortune. He makes a fortune at Standard Oil. And after he works at Standard Oil, he works, uh, he becomes a director of a bank and he becomes a, uh, an owner of the Ohio Railroad. And then he begins a, a new company called the National Lead Trust, which was a group of lead companies that were really trying to produce lead for paint, for the chem for, uh, to build, uh, I guess, you know, paint was mixed, used to make a mixture on paint, but commercially manufactured paint. So he bought Cookdale Farm in 1893 for about $135,000 plus the horse. Um, and he wrote this letter in 1893, also from the same collection from West Virginia. Dear Campbell, I have concluded the purchase of the Withers Farm. It takes about a quarter of a million dollars, and later on, I suppose, more to round it up. But the more I think about the way, the better I am satisfied that it was a wise and proper thing for me to do at this time. Both of my boys have got some bad physical taints. Willie, especially. Lewis, I think, will grow up. I am uncertain about Willie, but apparently in my surroundings, the best thing with my surroundings, the best thing I can do now is to learn in business and keep them in the open air. It furnishes a good relaxation for myself and puts me, as I think, in a more dignified position. And then the next month he writes him again. And in his next letter, he wrote, Dear Amanda, this is uh, April of 1893. Dear Camden, I know you can't read that, but it's just a copy of the National Lake Company letterhead with William Thompson sign at the bottom. I go down to the farm every Friday now, and it is a source of great delight. For the first time in my life, I've got something that I really wanted. And that I enjoy. I am very anxious for you to see the place and go over with you the general line of thought I have had in securing it and that I now have in running it. So I just love it. You know, I feel like that's something I always wanted, right? It's just, he really is just kind of effusive in his love for this farm. And so he and his wife live at the farm. Every Friday they go to the farm from New York and they enjoy the farm and they do a massive renovation on the Withers house that was in the papers as well that describes this enormous renovation that they did. However, in January of 1896, Mr. Uh, Colonel Thompson falls ill very quickly with pneumonia and within a couple of days he died. So he died in February of 1896 and in none of his letters did he mention Geraldine Morgan. There are lots of mentions of Betty's wedding and Betty's fiance and Betty's wedding is pretty like and his her, what her, you know, what her fiance Ralph Kristen is like, lots and lots and lots of that. Not one mention of Brody Morgan and Lou. And so Lou writes that note in May. So I was kind of hoping that I would get her father in law's impression already. <laughs> But he was not to come to pass. So I am going to assume that he didn't know it. That at some point, for some reason, no one ever introduced them, or it just did not work out. I don't know the answer to that mystery. But I got a lot out of those Camden papers. So they moved to Brookdale Farm. This is the, you know, the crane shot courtesy of the Mount County Park system. And so this is where they come and they live. And this is um, where they raise four children. They have four children. And they also raise five 
other children that were nieces and nephews from Luna's sister, Betty, and her husband. Betty died um, and after having a fourth child and internal complications. And her husband, Ralph Kristen, lives on that Brookdale farm and they are raised with the Johnson children. Betty Blackcock wrote, I just thought I had two brothers named Bill and two brothers named Lewis. Uh, so she, you know, they just were always together. It was a big, uh, a big crowd of children. And they also adopted Annie Thompson, who was orphaned because, as I said, and if you read the Thompson letters in the Gansen papers, a lot of these letters are about all the sickness and um, the death and the problems that the Thompson family has and all these orphan kids. And they're talking about who's going to take care of this kid and who's going to take this kid. And mom can't do it, she's too old. And you know, they're, they're dealing with all those kinds of family issues that we all deal with, right? Um, but Lou takes call, and Geraldine and Lewis raise all these kids on Thompson Farm. Thompson Farm, uh, Brookdale Farm, becomes her headquarters. In addition to the place where she raises her family, this becomes the centerpiece of her operations for social reform, the political activities, fundraising, it all happens at Brookdale Farm. She always has an open door, inviting the public, inviting, uh, having everything from the pet show in, uh, to having Eleanor Roosevelt there and inventing, entertaining governor and the senators and political dignitaries. So it really becomes a character in the book because of what it serves her and her work. And there's a picture of her having a meeting uh, in the house, and you could see her, you know, with her with her notes talking to her staff. And so I imagine her thinking of the Dale Farm as it sort of looked like a, a little village unto itself. Uh, everybody lived on the farm, not just the Thompson family, but the staff all lived on the farm. You have the whole horse operations going on, all those people. Uh, there's farming going on that it was sort of a, a really a, almost like a self contained little village under itself. But Lou's not there very much. <laughs> and this becomes uh, another really interesting part of her life and a little mystery as well. Lou spends much of the year at Sunny Hill Plantation in Georgia. He bought another farm in Georgia named Sunny Hill, which was on in Thomasville, Georgia, on the Florida Georgia line. And it was really known for quail hunting and had become a, a destination for a lot of very wealthy men to go and hunt and, and uh, you know, a lot of very, very big names and politics and, and business all loved to go to Thomasville, Georgia. For hunting, and that's Lou on the um, on the left talking to Walter Teagle, one of his friends. And they raised hunting dogs, and they had different uh, competitions and things. So he bought Sunny Hill Plantation in 1905. It was like about 12,000 acres. Again, he does the same thing as Withers. He buys all these horses, and he makes his farm bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, this is where he spends much of his time. He goes for September into the spring. So maybe about four or five months a year, he goes to Sunny Hill. And Geraldine goes down and visits them, and she goes down for part of the time. But they're not together a lot. And I think this has left uh, a, an impression. They must not have had a very good marriage. They must not have gotten along. Why is he not home more? Um, you know, Betty Babcock writes in her letters that he would go geese, Canadian geese in the fall, and then uh, to Sunny Hill, and he would go to the Florida Keys, and he would fish. And so every season had a hunting destination for him. Out west were hunting mountain lions. And he really was um, a winner doing this thing, but he enjoyed it, enjoyed being. I really disagree. I think I missed something. My PowerPoint here. So I hit something. Um, she 
I can think you. So here's a picture of Mrs. Thompson. Um, this looks to me like Sunny Hill. I think this that she is in Sunny Hill in this picture, um, especially with the wagon and everything. And um, interviews uh, with some of the staff that worked here uh, remarked she hunted, she was as good a hunter as the man. She was really good. And um, so, you know, that might be part of the reason why we really liked she was uh, she was game. She was game to go hunting. She was a good athlete. Uh, you know, she was going to go on and, and do what he did. You know, so uh, I think that that was part of it as well. And then there's this, and I found this. I thought, aha. So who's Dr. Henry Loomis? Dr. Henry Loomis was the Thompson doctor, and so we go back to Colonel Thompson's letters to Camden. He writes to Camden and he goes, oh, Annie's sick, this one's sick, that one's sick, this one has tuberculosis. Should I send them to Dr. Loomis? Dr. Loomis comes up in the letters. Dr. Loomis was probably the foremost lung specialist in New York. And he wrote an article in a handbook published in 1903 by the charity organization of the city of New York called A Handbook on the Prevention of Tuberculosis because tuberculosis is the biggest killer, right? We want to prevent it. And so in this part of this book, he writes that there's three things that are important for people who've had consumption. I remember, you had one lung. Okay. Water, sunshine, Colorado Springs, he mentions, good place to be. Two, the Adirondack Mountains. And I'm going to talk to you about the Adirondack Mountains next. We'll go to the Adirondack Mountains in the summer. Three, Thomasville, Georgia. That's who got. He's like, we're talking about Thomasville, Georgia specifically. Those three places are the places Dr. Loomis says if you want to stay healthy with consumption, that's where you go. These are the places that move goes. He follows doctor's orders, and he actually lives to be 70 years old in a family where everybody is dying or young. So I think Lou was following doctor's orders and I don't think that he was trying to get away from Geraldine. <laughs> That's my, my opinion from reading this. You want to get student altitude, dryness, and elevation. And then I found this, oh, this is the best. So I had been dying for a letter between Lou and Geraldine. I have letters from Lou to other people. I have letters from Geraldine to other people. I wanted to see how they talk to each other, desperately. One day, I just was in the Harvard papers of Miriam Van Rivers, as is my want, scrolling through PDFs and letters, and I said, you know, there's a folder here I've never clicked on. One of the folders I've never clicked on is miscellaneous. Always look at miscellaneous, right? So this is a miscellaneous folder that said miscellaneous parentheses, not Miriam Van Waters. I don't think I've ever looked in here. Click. The first thing that popped up is Lou's handwriting. And the letter, I know you can't read it, but that's Lou's letter. It's actually four pages long. It's a very long letter. But it starts off, I see the top of the letter and the the letterhead, and you can really tell when you see that the all had really nice printed stationery with their address on it. This one is actually stationery from a fishing boat in Keys. So the people in the archive did not know who these people were or anything. I had no idea. So this is a fishing boat in the Keys called the Twin Screw Charter Houseboat. The Scurry is the name of the boat. And the, boat, the letter starts off. Dearest honey. Dearest honey. And I see it's Lou's handwriting. So quickly I'll go to the last page. But who signed this one? And so at the end of the letter, he writes, you know, the, the letter is three pages of him chasing a tarpon around the Florida Keys and losing all his line. And it's like, Old man in the sea before Hemingway wrote it, right? So he is talking about this whole of stuff that's going on in the fishing boat. And then he gets personal at the end. 
You are the dearest person in all of this world to me. And I send you all of my love, always your own, Lou. I got it. I got the thing that I had wanted. And I said, see, <laughs> he wasn't trying to get away from Geraldine. He was, he loves her. And so uh, I think, you know, when you dig into this work, you never know what you're going to find. And it was just really wonderful to find this. And I think that the archive even has the wrong date on it. They have it dated 1924. I actually think it's 1934. So the Thompsons, 1905, this picture of this carriage, I was in it, Thompson kids, Lou's on the back, was put up on the back of the carriage. It's being driven by Bonnie Kelly, who had worked here for decades. His children and their children all worked here as well. And uh, the children are all piled into that carriage, except that um, Geraldine's not in this picture. I don't have a picture of Geraldine with four kids in, in the room. I don't have that yet. That would be my next talk. You'll see what I find there, right? Uh, so this was their, um, their family picture. Now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to read you part of the first chapter that I've written in this book. And the first chapter of this book, um, I'm kind of going to read it here because the first chapter of this book talks about something that happened in 1903. So the kids are, she's got three kids at this point, or four. She's got three children, small children. And it's a, the chapter begins not in New Jersey, but in the Adirondacks. So I'm going to get back to the Adirondacks. So every year, they would go to the Adirondacks for a month. They would rent a camp and stay in uh, a little three-room cabin and sleep outside under a tent on the uh, on a, a platform with a tent over. It was good to sleep outside if you had to wear clothes. It was good for your lungs. And all the kids learned how to swim and hike and canoe there. And so the Adirondacks held this very special charm for them. Luke, not so much. He didn't really love the Adirondacks. He went, but he would kind of come and go. But he did really like. He was an engineer, he was a trained engineer, he went to MIT. And he liked to tinker with cars, and he liked to tinker with boats. And in the early 1900s, he had built a speedboat using a wooden boat, and he put with it an automobile engine. So he built this really fast speedboat, and he loved to race it. He raced it here in the, the Navistink, he raced it. Uh, with the Red Bank Yacht Club. He took it all over the place. He raced his boat all over the place. And it plays a role in the story. It, the name of the boat is the Flying Frets, F-R-E-T-Z. And if you look it up um, in the newspapers, you see there's lots of articles about the Flying Frets. It's Luke raced all over the place. And he won a lot of awards. He won a lot of races with it. So they pack up their wagon, kids, pets, Staff, dishes, campers, trunks, it was a month up in the Adirondacks, and they take the kids from two days to get up there. Trains and uh, buckboards and guide boats to get to this remote place in the Adirondacks. And for years, they went to the Adirondacks. Even in the 1940s, there's some pictures of them with the grandchildren in the Adirondacks, uh, laying, you know, Mrs. Thompson laying under a tree reading a book. And so they, they continued to go for decades to the Adirondacks. So this is early in their marriage, 1903. They've been married for seven years. They've had three children. And something happens. So I'm just going to read you part of chapter one. Draft, draft, but part of chapter one. This is called The Pin. 
So here's where we're going to be. We're going to be in Upper St. Regis Lake in the Adirondacks. Beautiful wooded, calm lakes. And I love this picture. This is uh, one of the only pictures I have of Lou and Geraldine in the Adirondacks, actually. Probably about this time, about 1900. And before the chapter starts, I have a quote from Betty Backdrop from the Triangle of Land. You could absolutely count on her rushing to the rescue and being with you until you were safe again or dead. The plan. On July 10th, 1903, the summer routine was interrupted when a baby's screams filled the paper camp. Geraldine Thompson's seven-month-old baby girl nicknamed Puss started to choke while playing on their cabin's floor. The nurse, Mrs. Thompson, came running. When she examined the baby's clothes, she noticed empty pinholes where a small safety pin had once secured the child's waistband. The realization that Puss had swallowed a safety pin sent a burst of maternal adrenaline through Mrs. Thompson's body. As Puss gasped, they tried unsuccessfully to remove the pin by turning the baby upside down, holding her by her heels, and violently shaking her to dislodge the pin. When this failed, Mrs. Thompson panicked and reached her fingers down the child's throat to pull the pin out. She even tried to use a button hook to remove the pin to no avail. After 15 minutes, it was clear that they had made matters worse. The unclasped pin was now further down. The thought of the sharp point of the pin shredding the inside of the baby's soft throat set Remember Geraldine Thompson in motion. She grabbed Puss and ran to the boat dock on the lake. With the child perched on her hip, she started the engine of the flying threats and fast car. Her husband's enthusiasm for fast horses, fast cars, and fast boats came in handy that day. As the flying threats knifed through the lake, Mrs. Thompson disturbed the serenity of the camps, creating herpes mystery in Lake Water along the channel. Dressed in a white, high neck linen blouse and a long skirt, Mrs. Thompson sped by the Adirondacks camps. She piloted the flying threats through the calm, cold water of St. Regis Lake, for the only source of help over eight miles away. Thirty minutes later, flying threats reached Paul Smith's hotel. Opened in 1859, the hotel was the most well known summer resort in the Adirondacks. The over 300 room complex was the product of the famous hotelier. Paul Smith's personality and business acumen. More important, guests at the famous resort included two renowned tuberculosis physicians, Dr. Edward L. Trudeau and Dr. Walter B. James. Trudeau maintained a sanatorium nearby, so despite the remote location of the resort, it was fortunate that the cold mountain air attracted these men. Trudeau and James were trained at some of the finest hospitals in the country. As recovered consumptives, Geraldine and Lewis Thompson visited the region for their health as well as for the vacation. On this day, Trudeau's medical advice was going to draw not on his specialty, the lungs, but on an adjacent body part, the throat. Despite many years of treating patients in the sanatorium in Saranac Lake, the two venerable doctors failed to remove the pin. Within minutes of examining the puss, Trudeau and James determined that they did not have the necessary instrument for the procedure. Trudeau explained that the pin had gone down short side up and was stuck like a barbed hook where the esophagus narrows at the bone. During the vigorous struggle to remove it, the point of the pin embedded in the throat, and unless the proper instruments were used, the pin was likely to penetrate the trachea. The good news was that with the correct instruments, the pin could be removed in a matter of minutes. The bad news was that the lakes and mountains of New York State were 400 miles from New York City, and a hospital with the medical instruments needed to remove the pen. Unfortunately, the daily trains in New York had already departed from the local station. How could they get to a hospital 400 miles away in time to save the baby from grave danger? Mrs. Thompson decided that her best chance was to charter a special train to New York City. Without a moment's hesitation, she called the train station agent and said, get me a special train for New York at once. My baby's life depends on it. Not an instant's delay anywhere. In 1903, a special train was the only option, and an expensive one at that. 
At a cost of $1,000, Mrs. Johnson arranged the special train to take them to New York City as quickly as possible. Even so, they were facing a several hour journey from the remote reaches of the Adirondacks to the hospital in the heart of Manhattan. After over 15 minutes after she hung up the phone, they were on board the train bound for New York. When the station agent, engineer, and telegraph operator heard that the special train was ordered to save a baby, they acted to get the train to New York City as quickly as possible. The engineer opened the throttle wide and let the train travel as fast as it would go as they sped, sped past the train depots through the Adirondacks. The railroad through this part of New York ran on a single track as the special train sped past Sarawak Inn, Buffalo Lake, Chiswold, Alton Chain, and other stations. Any obstacles were hustled out of the way quickly to allow the special train to arrive in Utica in only three hours, nearly two hours faster than was normal. The station agents along the train's path sent ahead a message that the train was speeding to save a baby's life. Kindly, Dr. James and Trudeau accompanied them on the train. Telegrams were sent to Lewis Thompson, as well as to the fourth specialist, Dr. Joseph P. E. Winters. Trudeau continued to attend the course on the journey with remedies, including cocaine, and made her comfortable with ice to reduce inflammation. As the New York City towns and cities flew past the train windows, the once hysterical child was now growing weak and exhausted. Puss had not been fed because they feared swallowing would move the pin further down her throat. After suffering intense pain for hours, she was limp and blue. Without the strength to talk, her mother, the worried mother, ever took her eyes off the pitiable child. Despite the incredible efforts of the men on the railroad, there were some inevitable delays along the way. When the special train reached Fitchkill on the Hudson, a broken down freight train engine blocked the track, but after it was removed, it was clear sailing the rest of the way. Finally, a few minutes after 11 o'clock at night, the special train pulled into Grand Central Station, and the throat specialist, Lewis Thompson, were there to meet her. The party gathered the child and raced in the carriage to West 59th Street and 10th Avenue, the address of Roosevelt Hospital. Dr. Winter said everything ready for the procedure in the operating room, including the special instruments Dr. Trudeau had insisted were necessary that morning. Puss laid out the back of the examining table where a nurse administered anesthetic before Dr. Winters explored the throat. His examination revealed that the pin was deeply embedded in the left side of the throat where the esophagus meets the pharynx. Using a blood hook, Dr. Winters dislodged the pin and used Fauville's throat forceps on the outside of the neck to prevent the mouth's lead pin from being swallowed. Next, Dawson's flexible forceps, which are long and thin and whose shape matches the contours of the throat, grasp the pin, squeeze the ends of the pin together, and withdraw it. Post did not suffer any further injury during the procedure, and after the child's mouth and throat were rinsed with antiseptic, she was released from the hospital. The relieved and weary family went to Geraldine Thompson's mother's home on Washington Square, where Puss rested peacefully that night. After a long and harrowing day, it was all over in approximately five minutes. The doctor explained that Puss would not have been able to endure the pain for even one day longer. Due to the excellent, uh, so the instant removal of the pen had saved her life. The successful outcome was due to excellent railroading, the best doctors, and above all, the tenacity of Darlene Thompson. For the first time on July 10, 1903, Mrs. Thompson saved the day. Now I'm good, guys. That, that was hard for me. It's the first time I've <laughs> shared that with anybody. Um, so the idea that she kind of comes to the rescue, right? So uh, she, throughout her life, Saves the day many times. And one of the times that she saves the day um, also led to her founding of the County Organization for Social Services, which I mentioned earlier. In 1912, Mrs. Thompson appeared at a Monmouth County freeholders meeting where she explained to the freeholders that an African-American 
12 year old boy named Arkansas Bass was at that moment playing in Long Branch Hospital, suffering from tuberculosis that had moved from his lungs into his bones, that he was terminal, that one of his arms had been amputated. But his family was poor and he could not afford to go to the hospital. She explained that if he was returned to his home, he would be spreading tuberculosis to the other members of his family. That this was a public health danger and it was a humanitarian issue for the dignity of this terminally ill young man. And so in the papers, it reported she advocated for Arkansas Bass and asked that the Monmouth County freeholders pay for his care at a, at a tuberculosis hospital. She had contacted several and only two were willing to take it. And the freeholders said that they wouldn't think about it and see if it was legal for them to use county funds for the care um, that was needed. It was going to cost about $9 a week. And two weeks later, this piece appeared in the Daily Record, which is the Long Branch paper, and it says, boy incurable taken to hospital. That Arkansas Bass, who underwent several operations at the hospital here to prevent the spread of tuberculosis trouble, was taken to the Trenton Municipal and County Hospital for Tuberculosis. He was admitted for the efforts of Mrs. Lewis S. Thompson. And so she gets the county freeholders to agree to pay for his care. She knew that if she had them pay for Arkansas Bath, that she was setting a precedent for a public private partnership for healthcare. Monmouth County had no public service, they had no services. There were not enough hospital beds for the people that were here. There was not enough care. And so two weeks later, in uh, July of um, 1912, she holds the first meeting of the MCOSS, which at that time was the State Charity Aid Association. But she holds the first meeting of MCOSS at Brooklyn Forum in July. And it's still in operation today, 110 years later. She also advocated for the building of a tuberculosis hospital where people could go in Monmouth County, residents could go for treatment. There was nowhere for people in Monmouth County to go except for really far away. The freeholders told her, well, we don't know if there's a need and if people really want to pay for this. So get us a petition. So she has, she circulates a petition. Four years later, she shows up at another freeholders meeting. And I love this article because it says, a great bundles of paper was laid on the table. So she goes to the freeholders meeting in 1916, four years later, and she, well, she drops this enormous bundle of paper on the table that had over 12,000 signatures, which was half the voters in Monmouth County, to prove to them that it was needed to have a hospital in the county to serve people. When, you, when you're recovering from tuberculosis, you have to rest for a long, long time. So if you go to a tuberculosis hospital hours and hours away, you can't see your family, you can't get visitors. It's very lonely and depressing and isolating. So she wanted this to take place. 1921, they opened this hospital, which is the Allenwood Tuberculosis Hospital in uh, what is now Farmingdale. Um, so she, so we started in 1912, and then she's still fighting in 1916, and it's finally built and opened in 1921. And this is really the beginning of her career. And so in 1940, when she was interviewed um, in the papers, she said, nothing is futile. 
even if a project gets results once out of every five times or once out of every 10 times, that is something to be thankful for. At least that much has been accomplished. So she never gave up. She never gave up. And she didn't always win. She didn't always get her way. Didn't always lead to success. But she had this persistence and uh, the courage and the persistence to keep fighting for what she believed she was right. The fight for tuberculosis also hit very close to home. Her daughter, Puss, who was the host in the earlier story at the pin, um, in the 1920s, she got married. And she also did the midwifery course at Bellevue Hospital. She became a midwife. And she wanted to do frontier midwifery. So she went to Kentucky and she became a frontier midwife. When she became a frontier midwife, however, she caught the divorce. And so from the late 1920s, she suffered relapses and bronchitis and different kinds of lung ailments, some periods of health, but a lot of uh, a lot of periods of, of illness. And um, I'm including the picture on this slide of the back of the house with Belvedere, courtesy of Gail Hunter and Monmouth County Park System. That remember one of the things that to work with to work with your uh, victims needed sunshine. So she built these big windows in the back of the house for kids to be able to live on the third floor and to get the sunlight while she was uh, recovering. She took both everywhere for her treatment. She went to Saranac Lake and Dr. Tr you know, Dr. Trudeau's sanitarium up there. She went to New York for operations. She went to Arizona. She went to Colorado. She went all over for this. Uh, to, for her daughter's health. And she had a really hard time sitting still. You know, you have to be like bed rest for really long periods of time. And I saw a letter in the Eleanor Roosevelt papers from this that explained a little bit of her frame of mind, and I want to share it with you. So she wrote this letter to Eleanor Roosevelt while she was at Saranac Lake Sanatorium up in the Adirondacks. Dear Mrs. Roosevelt, my nerve endings are raw with fatigue, and I think therefore that I have a vague idea of how some of our European brothers feel. I don't mind not surviving, but I'm licked when it comes to this shadow world, and I'm not fit company for man or beast. Should things go well, you'll hear from me often. Should I disappear into thin air, I remember how much and how deeply I have loved and respected you, Mr. President. A heart full of love, plus love to my dear aunt, and please don't talk me over with my mom. She had a really fantastic sense of humor, and her letters were hilarious. Um, her aunt, when she says, love to my dear aunt, um, Eleanor Roosevelt's secretary was Malvina Thompson. No relation. But she always called her Aunt Malvina because they were both Thompson. Even though they're not related, she always called her Aunt Malvina. Uh, but she suffered terribly. And uh, you really, really feel her pain in that letter of facing death. Facing death, she died in 1949 at the age of 56. So all these accomplishments Mrs. Thompson had, all of these great triumphs in, in public health, she can't say one order. And it's really a big part of the story um, of Mrs. Thompson saves the day. Another one of her children also uh, faced enormous challenges. Her oldest son, Bill Thompson, Dr. Bill Thompson, uh, when he was a young teenager, I think he was about 15, the family took a trip to Switzerland in 1913. And while they were in Switzerland, Bill decided he was going to go out and uh, climb a glacier. And he never came back. And 
turns out he fell down the side of the glacier and landed, crushed his leg and landed on a landing, a light. They couldn't find him. And the uh, Daily Register reported on this September 10th, 1913, that the rescue party was sent out by his mother, succeeded in finding him the next day. So he was laying out on that ledge in the cold all night. When they found him, his leg was so badly damaged that the European doctor who saw him in the hospital wanted to amputate him. And the family said, no, we're going to go back to the United States. And, and he went and underwent dozens of operations and recovered after Tilton. And he did go back to school. He went to St. Mark's school as all the boys in the family went to the St. Mark's school, and then he went to Yale. He graduated from Yale and went to medical school, and he became a very well-respected doctor. But he was always disabled. And Laura Harding talks about, um, uh, in her interview, she says that when she saw Bill, he was using a walker. So Mrs. Thompson, she broke the Belvedere's puss, and she broke the one-story house for Bill, so he wouldn't have to go upstairs. So when you say that Cookdale Farm becomes a character in the story, that it's where people come for rest to restore, to rest, to recover, but also for fundraisers and meetings and activism, that it becomes the centerpiece of her life and plays this really important role. Mary. So I'm going to come back to Miriam here. I talked to you a little bit about her, um, about her diary earlier. And so Miriam writes in her diary, when she came to Brookdale, she called Brookdale for the weekend, Brookdale Magic. Because Brookdale Magic went to her rest and walking in the woods and getting back to nature and, and recharging her batteries. She was really famous in her own right. She was a famous reformer and a penologist and a a really well celebrated professional, she published many books. She had spoken at the United Nations. She was really, really a famous, famous woman. And she had a 40 year relationship with Mrs. Thompson. And I think she actually met Mrs. Thompson um, through Puss. Puss had bought, uh, purchased one of uh, Miriam's books for her mother because it was on prison reform. And she writes a letter to Mary Van Orders in 1927, where she says, hey, we write to my mother. Uh, you know, she would really love to hear from you. She's a real fan of yours. And they meet ultimately at a uh, corrections meeting in California. And that began a four-year relationship. And it's uh, very difficult for historians to decide the nature. What is the nature of this relationship? Um, these women did not call themselves lesbians. To be a lesbian was, at the time, a psychological diagnosis in the DSM. They did not identify as lesbians um, because of the stigma, and they, they did not consider themselves part of, uh, they did not come out of the And uh, nevertheless, we do have letters, and the letters speak for themselves. Uh, they are certainly completely in love with each other, um, support each other, and have an extremely affectionate correspondence. The fact that Betty Babcock never mentions Miriam in any of her writings is sort of a red flag. Betty was also very close with Miriam. Miriam is a member of her family. She was at every event. She came to Brooklyn. She was the godmother to Pusser's son. She was a member of their family, but never is she mentioned by Betty Babcock. Betty Babcock wrote to her. her letter, Betty Babcock has seen the letters in Miriam's paper too. So the absence, the deliberate protection of her mother from mentioning uh, Miriam at all. So I'm just going to read this uh, uh, letter. Now, Miriam did destroy most of their letters. She was um, being, uh, she was 
fired from her position as a superintendent of the Framingham Women's Performance Marine. And she was not accused of being a lesbian, but she was accused of being a permissive of lesbian behavior at the prison. So they didn't come out and accuse her, but they sort of And so during that period where she was under attack, she burned a lot of lives. And there's a, a whole article um, written about this. So I'm not going to go into that, but I am going to read you one of the letters. I actually wrote to him because I'm a blood and I can't, I can't decide. So here's one letter. This is one letter from 1929 from Geraldine Thompson to Marion Van Waters that survives and is in the Marion Van Waters papers. Marion, dearest, my love to you and every best blessing. I hope Christmas will give you a sort of rest and comfort and a rest. I have a heartache in coming home here without you. I looked into your room, hoping some miracle would let me find you sitting at the table near the window. You see, miracles do happen, have happened, and will happen again. And just tonight, I wanted the heavens to open. Good night, my dear, my dearest, yours, Charlie. And so, historians, this has sort of really been a great thing for Geraldine Thompson to have these letters discovered because it has really brought her back into the historical conversation. The historians are looking at these and are, are wondering and what to do and how do we categorize this woman had a marriage, four children uh, to New Thompson for 40 years until his death in 1936. And then she meets Marion Van Waters in about 1927. And they sort of get really close in about 1930 and until the 1960s, um, close to when Mrs. Thompson passes away, their relationship plans all that, all that time. So I think we should be happy for Goldie that she had this much love in her life, that she had these two people that she loved dearly and gave so much, gave her so much in her life. She was also a really great friend to Miriam. She helped Miriam with her career. She, provided money for her projects. She was an enormous support. So it's a really beautiful and, and supportive relationship uh, for us to look at. Here's another one of her uh, notes that she sent. She, she, gives, uh, she sends Miriam a little red teapot for her tea table at, uh, the, at the framing in, in Sherborne at her house. And she explains, you know, well, this little red teapot, it should give you warmth and comfort. I wish I was there with you at the tea table. And it's really a beautiful moment. The other part of Mrs. Thompson's life is politics. And she was a political force. It's really amazing to me how much the man, because politics is so male dominated, how she was able to stand in there with the men and get things done, even in this male dominated world of politics. And I gave this, this article in Asbury Park Press from January 29, 1920, that I thought was really, really cool. So January 29, 1920, women don't have the right to vote yet. And suffrage had been a really hot issue. And the article's title is GOP Machine Picks Big Four for Convention. So the GOP in the end of January, the Republicans met in Atlantic City to decide who's going to get the ballot. Lines, who's going to get, who are we going to put for governor, senator, all of that. Who's gonna, who are we going to pick? So this is sort of just as primaries are coming in, but there's still sort of backroom deals going on. It's smoky, back rooms. Who are we going to let be our candidate? But who's there? Mrs. Thompson's there. And I was absolutely amazed that the, towards the end of the article, it says, Mrs. Thompson sits in. And I can just imagine her with these, you know, who's at this meeting is, Nucky Johnson, do you guys work for War Empire? Nucky Johnson is there. Um, like these real characters and political bosses in this, this machine politics. And Mrs. Thompson's sitting there. And so Mrs. Thompson sits in. One woman was present at the conference. Mrs. Lewis L. Sloan, Thompson and Red Bank, sat in while the conference were discussing the plans of finance. She is the vice chairman of the Republican National Committee, and she was in charge of the money. 
And so she was going to have a say in who got what line. And I just think it's a really interesting part of her story how she is able to use her wealth and able to use her, uh, her influence in politics to protect her interests in public health and in the agencies, but also stand in there with these rough characters and still be the only woman in the room. Um, that had to be really hard, but really, really interesting part of the story. She was a staunch Republican. Uh, she was uh, the delegate, as I mentioned before, to the RNC from 1924 to 1952. She was a real fan of Eisenhower. Um, and she was the president of the New Jersey Women's Republican Committee, a Mama County committee woman, and after suffrage in 1924, out of five women joined the Republican Party in New Jersey. So it was by far the most uh, most women joined the Republican Party. So I'm just going to finish with this. Uh, should I go to Eleanor? Should I go to Eleanor? So Eleanor is a good friend of hers. They help each other throughout the 30s and the 40s, constantly attending each other's events and helping each other. Here's Eleanor at the uh, farm. And so let me just talk about what happens to the farm. So after working, believe it or not, I had kind of worked out the first chapter and the last chapter. It's the ones in the middle that are still kind of fluid. But the last chapter is going to be called An Unwelcome Gift. I called it An Unwelcome Gift because in uh, Betty Badcock's letter, one of Betty Badcock's letters, she talks about what was going to happen to the farm when her mom passed away. And Puss and Bill had both died in the 1940s. So the only two remaining Thompson children was Lewis Thompson Jr., who they called Pinky, and Betty. And Mrs. Thompson wanted desperately for a Thompson to live on the farm, to inherit, to carry on the Thompson name at we understand that, right? She had this real connection to this land. And she really, really wanted it to go to one of the Thompsons. Betty, of course, had been living in Long Island for many years. She was not coming back. None of the grandchildren were really uh, going to do it. And so she really kind of backs her son, Louis Jr., into a corner. And she wants him to take the farm. He had retired from the Air Force. Uh, he was the Assistant Secretary to the Air Force, the Eisenhower's administration, and he retired. He was very sick. He had uh, cancer. He had a cancer operation, um, but returned to work, didn't get better, and retired. And he retired with his wife from Washington, D.C. They left Washington, and they moved to Georgia to his wife's family's plantation there. Mrs. Thompson doesn't give up, right? We know this about her. And so she's going to try to back her son into taking the farm. You know, somebody wants you to do something, right? You figure out how to, how to get them to do it. So what she decided to do was she decided to give him part of the farm. And she takes part of the farm, 200 acres over here where Brookdale is, which was called the Church Farm, and she gives it to her. She says, oh, it'll be good for you. It'll be a tax write-off. And I'll be good, you know, for tax purposes. She's just trying to manipulate it, right? She wants him to have photos. And it kind of brought to mind, um, uh, you know, her personality, right? She, she ruled the family. She ruled every, you know, everything she did. In her will, she also made the vision to give part of the land to her grandson, Peter Van Berbick, who was Puss's son, who had really grown up on the farm. But she makes all these conditions that he can have the land if he lives here. She'll give him money to build a house if he lives here. So she's trying to push, using her will and using uh, what she can to force somebody to do what she wants, which is to live here on the farm. And it brought to mind a quote from her that was published in an article 
in a newspaper in 1951, and she told the reporter, I push and prod and get a certain amount done. I know I open doors. If I can't open them in one place, I try another. So she tried this. <laughs> and then she couldn't go to, so then she tried Peter. And so she's trying to like figure out who she's going to get to do what she wants. And then there's the top system. So as she was getting older, she was really preoccupied with what was going to happen to the farm. And there are several different organizations who contacted her. Rutgers wanted it. The Quakers, the Quaker Church wanted it. So she's getting one of these authors, and it's really well described in the, uh, the same book on the history of the modern county park system. But ultimately, she works out a deal with the Monmouth County Fair holders to donate 215 acres of the farm to the Monmouth County Park System for park land only. So she has a lot of, you know, she, she's very clear about her wishes. She wants it to be a playground. She wants it to be for children. She wants it to be for birds. And so ultimately, what she ends up doing is donating her land to make really the centerpiece of the Monmouth County Park System. Because in the 50s, the population was booming. There was not enough park space. And by donating her land to make the park, this is a, a Asbury Park Press article, she actually led the way again. And she led the way other women who had, park, had large parcels of land and farms followed her lead and Hearts Wind Woods and Huber Woods and these other uh, women also donated their farms up to their deaths as well. And so when I think about this unwelcome gift that nobody in the family ends up living here. So she doesn't win that battle. But I would think that if she knew that this college is here, providing education to the people of Monmouth County so that they could have careers and, and have their lives. If she knew the amount of people who jog and walk and bike and count park every day, I would have to think that she would be extremely pleased that her, that her land was not left to a member of the Thompson family, but it was really left to all of us as her family. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? I know I went on way too long. Oh, okay. I did. I got, I got the death certificate the other day. And it said that she had this paint. But during that whole year, from the picketing and the, from, to her death, she's like working and, and protesting and doing all this work. And it was just so shocking to me. And the sad, there's so much more sad about that story. I mean, you could just weep with the story. Ten days later, her husband was like really essentially a broken heart. Uh, but it really happened. Um, and her son had died in 1923. He was a senior at Princeton, and he was visiting here uh, at Brookdale Farm, and he um, died in a car wreck in Asbury Park uh, with her children. They were all out that night dancing, and he gets in the car wreck, and he's killed. You know, terrible. So it's, it's a, there's, a, there's so much very rich uh, but sad episode. There's some comments. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. Sure. Yes. Um, Jane, uh, so in talking to me at the Parsons and about doing this book, I was thrilled to death because um, I just want to tell one short story about Carolyn Thompson. Um, after the original 
Alex Burn, you may remember there was a tragic fire in 2006. I um, had the feeling, the distinct feeling, that the memory of Gerald and Thompson was lost in the institutional memory of the country. And uh, as a historian, like Jim, didn't have to the uh, time or enthusiasm and the talent that you have to do a biography that I am a great fan of Gerald and Thompson. Um, there was a fence around the burning house somewhere in the and stood for some time and it was company, insisting on salvaging parts of the burning village weapon from the burning house. So it sat there for about a year. And day after day, people would come up to that house. And I would go over there and talk to them. And every single one of them would have to be the first house, just the way it was. They would talk about knowing Geraldine Thompson in a way where he could be vented from her, and I don't think they can much. And that was the, uh, they gave me the power, you know, to go for the papers and executive sessions. When they were not sure that we should rebuild the house of Braylon Smith and say to them, You have to do this to honor the legacy of Geraldine Thompson. Mm -hmm. And if it hadn't been for that, like, what would you call it, that thread from history to remind our county leaders that there was such a person as Geraldine Thompson, she had a mental impact in our county. We might want to have this beautiful museum to do So I'm thrilled that you're doing it. Thank you for it. Well, you know, you know, your support for this, your support through this project has been so important to me. And um, everybody who's helped me, who's answered my, uh, um, answered my emails, and I test her everybody. And um, I know all the tests. But, you know, it has meant the world to have the support of, of all the different people who um, are willing to help me. And Gail, you've been just amazing. I just want to invite you, when your book is published, we would like to have a book signing party in Geraldine Thompson's. Uh, <laughs> yeah, excellent. That would be so wonderful. Absolutely. Okay. Just, all right, so somebody writes, thank you for presenting this, but I have to go. Okay, thank you. And the other person wrote about, um, were the others educated similar to Geraldine? Did they attend any school? So her sisters had the same education as she did, um, but Mrs. Johnson's children went to boarding school. They had, they had private tutors. They had French, uh, they called them the French Mademoiselles. Her French teacher, so she carries that sacred heart uh, education into her children's lives, and then she also sends them to private uh, boarding schools like Rare Lady for the Girls and St. Mark's School for the Boys. And then the boys uh, went to, I think she went to Princeton, Bill went to Yale, and Puss and uh, Betty went to Foxcroft in Virginia. So Ben, Gordon, do you have any any uh, any thoughts, any any questions, anything that comes to mind? <laughs> oh, fantastic! That's wonderful. Thank you so much for coming. It really has meant a lot that I've had to contact with you and with some of the other great grandchildren who have been willing to help me. They provided some of the pictures that I actually was able to use tonight 
uh, we're provided by the great grandchildren find things in the basement um, that have been really, really fantastic and have added so much to my research process. I can't tell you um, how much it has meant to me to have the family's input in the project. It has meant the world really has. And just have the support, you know, that I could write and say, what, you, what happened, you know, that kind of thing. It's, it's really been important. Thank you guys so much for listening to that very long presentation. <laughs> Thank you to our Zoom participants. If anybody has any questions or comments, please feel free to put it in their Q&A or chat. Then I'm gonna yeah.